Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend in trial sore. I go to him for blessings and he gives them o'er and o'er. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain. Sunshine and rain, harvest and grain. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me and true to him I'll be. Watches o'er me day and night, following him by day and night. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting days shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy. He's my friend. Amen. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful day. Thank you for this blessed time we have to meet together. I'm thankful that we have a friend in Jesus, and what a friend indeed. He's so good to us. Father, I ask you to be with us. Send your spirit, Lord, to minister to our hearts. Help us to be focused. Help us to be attentive to the word that you want us to hear today, Lord. Help avoid any and all distractions, Lord. Keep us safe. Keep us hidden in the cleft of your rock. We love you, Lord, despite the tempests around us. We're safe in here. I thank you for all you do, continue to do, and promise to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. <clears throat> I'll actually be in Matthew chapter 9, continuing on in the series of Follow Me. Today we're talking about follow me to glorify God. Follow me to glorify God. Now in the previous chapter, we found a leper healed. We found a centurion's servant healed. And both those examples showed us how we ought to act in faith. The leper saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. In other words, if you desire, Lord, you can do all things according to your will. The centurion said, speak the word only. And he had the faith to understand that if God says it, it is true and will come to pass. We also saw in that same chapter, Peter's mother-in-law. Look with me in uh, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 16. It also says, And when even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Now it's amazing because what he's talking about here is both being possessed with devils and being taken of various infirmities. He's talking about the spiritual and the physical problems. And Jesus here signifies that he with his word can heal both. There's nothing physical nor spiritual that God does not have complete and total control over. We need to trust that by faith and realize that. God's in control of everything. I know that we get closed-minded because we're here in this temporal world of flesh and blood and plants and animals and, and things that we can actually feel and touch. But there's a world beyond that 
that we can't touch, taste, feel, or interact with with our senses. God has control over both those things. And don't worry about either of them. If you're in his will, you ask according to his will, he shall give according to his will, and you'll receive the petitions that you ask of him. That was the whole point of last week's discussion. So we see Peter's mother-in-law is healed. We see two possessed with devils that are healed. Both physical and spiritual healings happen according to his word and by his word. That's where the power is. Now we're going to continue on in Matthew chapter 9. Again, we're following Jesus. He's trying to make us fishers of men. We're following him. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It's not you become a fisher and invite God along for the ride. No, you follow him, and that is actually what makes you able to catch men, able to impact men's lives eternally. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 1, the Bible says, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, laying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Here he comes with a sickness, but he didn't come, no. He was stuck in a bed. His friends brought him in his sickness. It says here, their faith was what Jesus saw. And therefore Jesus said unto the sick of the palsy, the man that was sick of an infirmity of the flesh, he said to him, thy sins be forgiven thee. The sick has their sins healed and forgiven. Now, it was their faith again that they offered unto Jesus. And we need to understand that our faith, our personal faith, can go toward the healing of someone else. It can go towards the salvation of someone else. They don't even need to react here. Here, the, the man that was sick of the palsy was in his bed. There was nothing he could do to get to Jesus. It was the faith of his friends that picked him up and carried him to Christ that eventually saw this man saved of his sins, forgiven of his sins. Their faith, not his faith can go towards then healing someone else. Someone that won't go to Jesus for themselves. Someone that won't, of their own accord, go and seek after God to believe on Him and trust in Him. Notice, God allows for the faith of His servants to influence their life in a big way. Again, we talked about that last week, how we ought to be praying for loved ones because God's will is not that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everybody to be healed of this sin sickness that we have. But most won't go to Jesus of themselves. So we got to bring them to Jesus. And that's the role of a soul winner. That's the role of somebody who catches men. They bring their friends that are reluctant to the point where they can see Jesus heal their sins, heal their sicknesses. Continue on in verse 3, as they often do, the religious about to scoff and mock at Christ. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? So they thought to themselves, they said within their own selves, He's blaspheming. Why? Because He's saying to this sick man, Your sins are forgiven you. But Jesus is wise to this. He knows their thoughts and asks them that pertinent question. Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? It's an evil thought to think that the Lord Jesus Christ was blaspheming at this time. Nevertheless, we see the same event play out over and over and over where the religious have resistance to the work of God and they push back and they kick back and they question and they even take what God is doing and attribute it to a devil or attribute it to someone with wrong intentions, blaspheming against God. It's not the case. Now, a good question is asked here in verse 5. It says, For whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. Now, Jesus knew their thoughts. He asked them the question, Why are you thinking evil? Then he poses this question on top of that back to them. What's easier to say? What's easier to proclaim? Your sins be forgiven you, or arise and walk? Now, as I thought about this, what is both of these are hard to do, of course. To have somebody healed of their infirmity right before your eyes or to or to heal someone and forgive someone of their sins a very difficult thing for any man to proclaim but the question is what is easier to say now if it was thy sins there is no tangible manifestation required if you were to say to someone i forgive your sins the catholic popes do it all the time 
You're absolved of your sins. You know, the man in the confessional booth says, I forgive your sins. It's easy, it seems, for them to say that. Because there's no tangible manifestation required. There's nothing you can look on somebody and say, well, their sins weren't forgiven. Then they went to the box and they came out, oh, I could tell that their sins were forgiven because look at them. There's nothing you can see, so there's nothing tangible required. But it also is a bold proclamation, and I would say it's considered blasphemy because who has control over the judgment of sins but God himself? Who is in control? of forgiving or not forgiving sins but God himself and he has the requirements set forth about how to get your sins forgiven so what is is that a hard thing to say well in some cases it is because it's bold and it's actually an affront towards God in other ways it's not because men won't even recognize if you're lying or not when you say your sins are forgiven you now regarding arise and walk this is completely different it's almost the flip side of things where if you say to someone arise and walk Everyone's expecting something tangible to happen, right? Everyone's expecting that person to arise and walk. And when that doesn't happen, right away you'll be seen as a phony. So it's easier then to say your sins are forgiven. It's not so easy to say arise and walk, but thy sins be forgiven is bold and blasphemy against a holy God. And saying arise and walk really has no spiritual consequence aside from the fact that you are usurping something and an authority that is God's. God is the only one that has supernatural power over the physical. There's all sorts of lying signs and wonders that go on in this day and hour, but we know that in truth, the only one that can manipulate this physical presence, make somebody that is sick or, 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 uh, or broken or lame to stand up and walk, the only one that could do such a thing is God. And this is why Jesus did many miracles. He went about doing good to show himself strong, to show the power that he had as God himself in the flesh. Now, we continue on. That question was asked, what is easier to say? And I think there in Matthew chapter 9, he's asking that question simply to confound those religious folks. They're scratching their heads wondering, I don't know what's easier to say. But Jesus is going to continue on in a lesson that he is trying to teach. As always, not necessarily to these religious hypocrites, because they're not going to listen anyways. He's teaching his disciples. And what he's teaching his disciples is, Follow me to glorifying God. Verse 6 it says, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. So Jesus just had a sick man come to him. He proclaimed to him, Your sins are forgiven you. They took offense to that, and he said, What's harder to say? I'm going to heal you, or that your sins are forgiven you? But he puts this forth that you may know that I have power on earth to forgive sins. That you may know that that, 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 um, that healing of sins, which should have no tangible, visible, outward um, appearance to it, that you may know that I have power over the sins that men commit, I'm going to heal this man that can't walk. Jesus is going to say both. What's harder to say? Well, I will just say both. And we'll watch you all squirm, essentially, is, a, is what he's trying to do. To show his power on earth, in heaven, he manifests his power over his power in heaven on earth. Let me say that again. To show Jesus, to show his power on earth in heaven, he manifests his power in heaven on earth. And as a result, that man is healed. Look at verse 7. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. This man is healed, and God gets glorified. And that's the end that Jesus requires. That physical or spiritual healing is to the intent that God would be glorified in the end. And we ought to have that same mindset. Why do we heal people physically? Why do we help people, mend them, give, do the best we can to care for them, that God would be glorified? That has to be our mindset. Why would we take somebody and lead them to Jesus so that God would be glorified? And that should be our only desire. Follow me to glorify God is what he's showing here. And of course, as always, it goes right over the religious people's heads. They don't get it. They're going to they're gonna ponder. They're going to say that Jesus is blaspheming. They're going to they're gonna question the miracles. They're just going to do everything they can to, to stop their ears, close their eyes, and just not have what Jesus is doing enter in. Continuing down in verse 9, it says, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me, and he arose and followed him. So here, Matthew, the namesake of the book, 
simply gets up and follows Jesus on the command of his word. Verse 10 it says, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? The religious come into the presence of the Lord, and they ask, Why is he supping with sinners? Why is he sitting with these unclean people, these people that aren't as morally right as me, that aren't as clean and proper as me, that aren't as religious as me? Why is Jesus the one claiming to be the master of all, the one that's doing these great miracles, why is he sitting with such lowly and base people? Well, Jesus is going to give them the answer, verse 12. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Okay, so he makes that statement. The whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Good practical advice here. You don't need to go and seek after a physician unless you're sick. Okay? He continues on, says, But go ye and learn what that meaneth. <laughs> so I think he's giving them that, that thing that seems plain, that statement that seems very crystal clear to us, even in a practical sense, and, and in a physical sense, right? I don't generally go to a doctor unless I'm feeling sick, or something's broken, or something's injured, right? That's when I start to think about going to the physician. That just makes sense. That's, that's common sense to me. But he says to them, he says, go ye and learn what that means. So there must be something more to it. He says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And that's all that these were about. They were about sacrifice and doing and showing works and, 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 and basing themselves and, and humiliating themselves, but that they would be seen as men was the problem. And Jesus said, I would rather have mercy. I would rather do mercy. I would rather show mercy than have a bunch of sacrifice come my way. For I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Because the sick need a Savior, and that's why He is supping with them. That's why He is close to them. That's why He is enjoying fellowship with them. Is because those that are sick are the ones that need the great physician. The whole, in this context, are just in denial. They're like those righteous men that need not repentance. But God goes to the 99 and brings him because he needs to come back. He needs to return. He needs to be healed. He needs to be be saved. But these 99 just men, these 99 righteous, they need no repentance. They're just lying to themselves. They're in denial because the Bible is clear. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have that sickness upon us, that sin sickness that we need to be healed of. Verse 13, he says, go learn what that meaneth. He says, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's the sick of sin. Those that are plagued with that disease of sin that are being called to the salvation that Jesus Christ offers. Jesus will, and Jesus wants to, and it's his desire to show mercy to sinners. That's why he's always finding himself in their presence. He would rather give mercy to a thousand sinners then have one self-righteous Pharisee bring him a bunch of sacrifice. He desires mercy. He has no interest in sacrifice. And you can go to Hosea 6.6, I believe, and God is talking about this same thing. He says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. This is what God wants to do in this world, is show mercy to others. He's not in this to gain. He's in this to sacrifice. He's the sacrifice. He's the sinless lamb slain from the foundation of the world. What sacrifice does God need to be laid before his feet? Will he just return it again unto you? He doesn't need anything. He has no need of sacrifice whatsoever, but it is his desire to show mercy unto all. He's a giver. He's a giving God. He's not hoping to receive and to gain like the idols of this world that want you to lay to your fruits before them, or these idols of this world that desire you to give your money and give your time and give your effort and whip yourself. God is not interested in that. God wants to show mercy unto those that are least likely to, to have it, <laughs> to the sinners, to the, to the broken, to the sick people of this world. Those are who God wants to bring to repentance. And he gets the most glory in that, doesn't he? Does anyone, the, not too many people question the, you know, the, uh, the, the 
child that was born Baptist, grew up Baptist, was saved at five, lives a good life, and then stays on the straight and narrow throughout his, his journey. People don't get shocked or, or glorify God in that. He was just raised that way. It makes sense that he would live a righteous life because he brought up in righteousness. But God gets glory when sinners and publicans and heathen and wicked people later in life come to the Savior and receive of the Savior's mercy. Why? Because it, 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 it's striking. It looks better. It's like, wow, this person was on a one-way ticket to hell, one-way ticket to destruction. They were ruining their lives physically and spiritually, and God miraculously saved them, and he gets great glory over that. In, in reality, that person that grows up and is sweet and clean and looks good all of their lives, it's just as much of a miracle if they're saved. It's just from the outside looking in. Men don't see it that way. So God wants to get glory, and so God goes first to the publicans and sinners and sups with them in order that he could heal them. Christ heals then to show his power in the heavens. We already talked about that. We lead someone to the great physician to what end? It ought to be the same, to show the power that exists in heaven. Not my own power. I can't go up to heaven and bring down power and use it in this world. No, it's God's to distribute. And so God gets the glory whenever a sinner is miraculously saved from their sins. Even to uh, the physical world, whenever somebody who is physically sick gets miraculously healed of their sickness, the glory also ought to go to God, first and foremost. But here God is clear. He's using the temporal. He's using what happens here and the healing that happens here to show that he has power in heaven to forgive sins. And that's his whole desire in doing so. Christ is proving himself to be who he said he was. Now we ought to bring so bring people to the physician to glorify God. The religious will always bring people to the physician in order to gain and to gloat and to glorify themselves. Don't they? We see that all the time. But our hearts have a tendency to go in that direction also. To start to glorify ourselves for the good works that we're doing. To start to glorify our church for the great works that we're doing. We ought to, though, be focused on what Christ is teaching the disciples here. If we're going to be fishers of men, we need to be focused on glorifying God Almighty. Verse 14, let's continue. And then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off? But thy disciples fast not. So here again, just an example of why they are of, of the religious mindset. They're wondering why the disciples of Jesus aren't doing such great and wonderful works that they are doing. But the Bible is clear, and you can go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6, and I'll read it quickly. 6 and verse 16, actually. Where it just says, plainly, moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily, truly I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Well, if these disciples were living out the teaching that Christ was given, the Pharisees wouldn't even know if they were fasting. And yet they come to Christ and say, why are your disciples not fasting? Well, maybe they were, and they just didn't see it, because they weren't doing it for to be seen of men. And that was the problem with the religious hypocrites. They were always getting glory for themselves. They were always trying to disfigure their face and be like, oh, I'm fasting, I'm, I'm so hard up for the Lord, and they don't even wash their hair that day, and they're, they're moping around, and everyone's like, oh, what's wrong with you? Well, I'm just so holy and sanctimonious that I've given this day unto the Lord Almighty in order that I might fast and I might be, be uh, receiving of a blessing from Him. And, you know, I'm just such a great and wonderful religious person. And then everyone goes, wow, you are such a great and wonderful religious person. And they're like, yep, I know. It's not the intent of behaving and acting according to God's Word. And so their challenge here that says, you know, we fast often, you fast not. It's just, it's just ignorance. Because they might have been fasting. But Christ continues on and he teaches. Now can the bridegroom fast as long as... I'll read it in 15. And Jesus saith unto him, Can the children of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast. No man putteth on a piece of new cloth into an old garment, for that which is 
put in to fill it up, taketh from the garment, and the rest is and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put a new put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish, but they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Jesus here is trying to give these Pharisees something new. Something new to them. Something they've never comprehended. You mean I can serve God without everyone looking at me and loving me and thinking I'm so wonderful? You mean I can serve God without everyone worshiping at my feet and thinking that I've done some great one? You mean I can get I can get God the glory and not just keep it all unto myself? He's showing them something new, but just like the bottles and just like this old garment, they won't receive it. They're going to bust open when that new wine comes into them, that new thing comes near them. When Jesus goes to place that new cloth upon them, they're just going to get ripped up and torn up and all upset and worried and, and confounded and angry and say, He's blaspheming! You see, Jesus is trying to show them a better way to interpret the law that they know oh so well. They've interpreted the law as do, 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 and they're on their way to hell because they're trusting what they've done to get them into heaven. But Christ is saying, done, 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 give God the glory, you shall receive all that I promise. And they're just like, rip, bust. They don't get it. And Christ knows it, and this is why he always answers them with these, these things that to, to the spiritual man, the one that's judging righteously the words that are entering into their ears, goes, ah, oh, that makes perfect sense. I'm not sick, why do I need a physician? That makes perfect sense. But they're, they don't get it. Jesus is trying to give them something new. They simply will not receive it. They're like those 99 just people that need no repentance. I don't need no repentance. I'm right. I'm good. I've done everything God asked me to do. He's going to certainly let me into heaven. And when Jesus comes to them, they say, Hey, what good thing do I have to do to get into heaven? He's like, Keep all the commandments. They're like, Yeah, I done it. I'm good, right? I'm going to heaven. I've kept all the commandments. <laughs> nope. But they think they need no repentance. They think they're whole. They think they're righteous. They're given all of the glory of what they expect to receive in heaven to themselves. God's going to give me wonderful things because I am so great, because I am so full of sacrifice. And Jesus is saying, you missed it. I want to give you mercy, but you're not a vessel fit to receive it. Because you can't even admit that you're sick. You can't even admit that you are injured. You can't even admit that you are lacking. You've sinned and come short of the wonderful glory that I have. I'll give it to you if you just admit that you need it. You can't get it yourself. I don't need repentance. I'm whole. I'm righteous. And so Jesus turns and just continues to show the example of his power over sin by healing more of their sicknesses. Look at verse 18. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Can you imagine the Pharisees that just heard this? You know, you guys won't receive what I'm teaching you. You guys, you guys will not understand that I am the one with power to forgive sins. I am the one that is healing. I'm not blaspheming. I'm simply performing the work and the will of God here. You're missing it. And then as he's teaching them, one walks up and says this great faith statement again. My daughter is dead. Come and lay your hand upon her and she shall live. And they're like, what? What is happening here? What kind of blasphemy? What kind of witchcraft? What kind of... And that's, that's to this day what the religious Jews believe, is that Christ was here doing miracles in the power of Beelzebub, in the power of witchcraft. And that's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost because it's His power that gave Christ power to do great works here. It's the power of God that is showing itself strong and powerful in this world. And they missed it and called it the power of the devil. And this comes to him and says, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. In verse 19, and Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Follow me, and I shall make you fishers of men. And the disciples now seem right on board with it. Verse 20, it says, And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years 
came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. Watch this. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. She said within herself, I am not whole. I am sick. And if I just come and touch the master, the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Verse 22, it says, But Jesus turned about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus was coming to the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. Let's not be so hard on these. Because I would say that, yeah, the father came and said, My daughter is sick. Come and touch her and she shall be made whole. He had the faith to believe as he was removed from the situation, I think. But these were there mourning and making mince. They were, they were doing the minstrel ship. They were, they were singing and, 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 and mourning. And that was part of, part of their duty as, as minstrels playing music at what would be the funeral time and making a great noise. And people are, are sad and, 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 and just devastated about the loss of this girl. And Christ enters in and says, she's not dead. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> Who is this man that just shows up and just makes such a statement verse 25 but when the people were put forth he went in and took her by the hand and the maid arose and the fame hereof went abroad into all that land and herein gets God glory he comes in and enters in and upon the faith of one father Lord you can heal my daughter simply touch her Jesus says I will comes touches her she arises and that fame thereof went abroad Verse 27, And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And this is where God just, his ears perk up, he gets a big smile on his face. He just said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I desire to show mercy. And here these two blind come, feeling their way, using a stick as it were, to, to find their way. They, they were blind, and they desire to see have mercy on us, they say to Jesus. And you know Jesus is just smiling ear to ear, and he's ready, and he's, he's able. Verse 28, And when he was come into the house, the blind man came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that thou, see that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. I think what it's talking about fame here, it ought to be pointing to God's glory. And this is why Jesus often was like, you know what, don't say it. Don't spread it abroad. Don't go telling everybody about what took place. This is between you and God. And in other places he said, go after healing and offer to God that portion, that sacrifice in his temple. Give him the glory. Give him the praise. And I know that Jesus was the Son of David, the Son of God, the King of kings, Lord of lords here upon earth. But he wanted the Father to receive all the glory because he knew that when he was taken up and he wasn't there tangible, that's where the glory ought to be. The people need to remember that Christ was subservient here unto the Father, underneath the Father, in the Father's will while he was here on this earth. And as such, he wanted people to look to him and give him the glory as these good deeds were put forth. We're continuing on, and Jesus is just healing these. And why was he healing? What was the purpose of him healing? Well, he said it. He said, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. That's why he healed the sick. That's why he made the lame to walk. That's why he made the blind to see. So that men could know that he has power on earth to forgive sins. So that men would know that he has this great power in heaven as he shows it upon earth. And his power in earth is reinforced by the power that he has in heaven. He's proving himself to be God Almighty at this time. And they went out. Behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. That's verse 32. Verse 33. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. And the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never so seen in Israel. 
People are starting to just marvel at all the great works that Christ is doing again and again and again and again. And every time he does so, and they try to give him glory, though he accepted worship, and every time they come to him and try to lift him up and revere him, though he did accept worship in certain times and places, he wants to give God the glory in all things. The Pharisees don't get it. Verse 34, they said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. I think at this point it's water off a duck's back. Jesus is really realizing that they are not getting it. Their heart is hard. Their eyes are blind. Their ears are dumb. And all around them, those same problems are being healed by the Son of God. Yet they will not. Why? Because they will not accept the fact that they need to be healed. They are sick of the disease. And so Jesus carries on in verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And even as Christ goes healing and pointing people to the physician and pointing people to the Savior and being that Savior in their lives, hey, so send to us. Look at verse 1 of chapter 10. When he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And we sometimes look to ourselves and say, you know what, that was, I guess, for a time long ago, I don't have power to heal someone of cancer. I don't have power to heal someone of a broken limb. I don't have power to heal someone of COVID-19. I don't have power to heal the sick. But God gives us power over the greatest sickness of all. What is that? Sickness of sin. Amen. Recognize that and remember that and relish in that. And love the fact that He sends us with that same power. Look at verse 7. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely you have received. Freely give. As you have freely received, freely give. And give glory to God along the way. This is what Christ wants from us. He wants us to go about healing. Go about doing good. Go about being salt and light in this world. Go about confounding the religious Pharisees. I just won't get it. And won't see it. All power is given you in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and preach. And I believe that what he's talking about here is as you do... Don't accept glory for yourself. It's God that has the glory. Remember, he pointed out the fact that he has power on earth to the end that he can show he has great power in heaven. And any power you're given here on earth ought to reflect that same thing. And the power that is in heaven is the one that enables you and gives you power and strength to do great things here on earth. It's reciprocal, the power transfer, but it should all point the glory of heaven above. Follow me, Jesus says, to glorify God. And as he teaches them, so he sends them. And so he sends you. I think you 